Hello, I'm Jorge Gestoso. Welcome to a new program from Washington. On today's show, the Ebola pandemic. Our guest, Melvin Food, founder of the CFA, the Constituency for Africa. Melvin Food, a uh, warm welcome to the program. Thank you, it's great to be here. Mr. Food, how serious would you say that is this Ebola epidemic? It's absolutely uh, astounding. And uh, I've been working on Africa for more than 35 years and I've seen a lot of things. We were at the forefront on the HIV AIDS uh, pandemic and did a lot of work to get that scaled up. But uh, I haven't seen anything um, like uh, Ebola. And we've known about it for a long time, but it hasn't affected large numbers of people. And for the first time, it has uh, really uh, affected large numbers of people in urban areas. And so the transmission of it, uh, uh, how do you defeat it? How do you deal with people who are affected? There's just a whole lot of issues that are out there that makes this one a lot more uh, complicated and more challenging than anything that we've seen before. We've seen countries like Liberia, Sierra Leone, and Guinea, like the, the three countries with uh, the most cases. Yeah. yeah, those are the three that are the target, but everybody knows that if it's not controlled and soon, uh, the, the, the chances for uh, spreading is great, uh, not only across Africa, but really globally. We've seen cases now in the United States, we've seen them in Spain, we see them other places around the world are starting to show up. And so if, uh, if this is not uh, controlled uh, in a reasonable, um, within a couple of months, I think it's gonna spread uh, dramatically on the global side. They're even mentioning a, a figure of something like two million people could be dead by the beginning of the next year if uh, measures are not taken. Yeah, the numbers are just astounding. And uh, the question uh, largely is, is political will and resources. You know, uh, these countries are, are hurting. Not only they, are they hurting uh, from the ap epidemic of uh, Ebola, they're hurting now from economic, they're, they're hurting from stigmatism. Um, these countries are fragile. Uh, you know, these countries are all coming out of war. They're basically getting their economy straight. They're finally getting some forms of democracy in place. And that to be hit by something like this is absolutely overwhelming uh, for these countries and for the region. And so uh, I think for many reasons, uh, this one here is, uh, the world is gonna have to scale up and to step up and we're hearing you know, we're hearing that's taking place, but it's going to step up like we never done before to address Ebola in West Africa and globally. And we were hearing, precisely here in Washington, that the headquarters of the IMF are based, that it could cost something like $32 billion to try to fight against Ebola. Yeah, I mean, I think the numbers are astounding. And I think it's a situation as such that we can't even talk about the numbers. We just got to deliver. We got to deliver on research. We got to deliver on treatment. We got to deliver on education. We got to deliver on economic development. Uh, the list goes on. But I think that uh, the world has never seen anything as uh, dramatic uh, and as challenging as uh, this uh, epidemic. Would you say that it was at certain point negligence? Because we have seen in the past few cases, isolated cases of Ebola in Africa, but they were isolated. Suddenly, the whole thing spread like a wildfire. What went wrong? I think there's a lot of blame to go along. You know, I think. Um, Certainly the West uh, can be blamed. Uh, you know, we're getting oil, we're getting gas, we're getting timber, we're getting food products, we're getting all of this from Africa, you know. And some can argue about fair trade, some can argue about, um, you know, are we also helping to develop these countries, you know, or are we only interested in their natural resources? Well, that's one big argument. I think is, is it holds water. I think that is something that needs to be addressed. But also the countries themselves have got to uh, look up and you got to ask yourself, uh, are they doing what they need to do uh, to address the health systems in these countries, to, to address education systems in these countries? Are you waiting for the NGOs and the foreigners to come in and you know, build your health system? Are you waiting for us to come in to build your education systems? Are these countries investing in the infrastructure and the human side of their own people uh, is, a, is a real question. Uh, after we completed, uh, well, not even completed, the, well, the battle against HIV AIDS, um, that question came up you know, about uh, health systems. And, all the countries are talking about, yeah, we're going to have to build this health system. We're going to have to do this. We're going to have to do that. But what I see, they haven't, took, you know, they didn't take any a action in that direction. And you're looking at the fragility of these health systems in these countries. It, it's just as bad as it was 10, 20, 30 years ago. That, you know, it's not just us uh, who are at fault here. I think the African countries, the Africa Union, all of us are in this together. And it's not necessary to point fingers because we're all going to have to do things to address it uh, because it's not limited to those countries. And if it's not addressed in Liberia, Guinea, and Sierra Leone, uh, we will certainly be dealing with it in Washington, Ottawa, and London, and, 
and all the other parts of the world. Do you see any similarities between the, um, the AIDS virus epidemic and Ebola? Yeah, well, AIDS back then, uh, we didn't know a lot about it. We didn't know how it was being transmitted. We didn't know who was infected, uh, you know, how you get infected and all of those questions. And once somebody was determined to be infected in Africa, the stigma set in. And nobody wanted to talk to you. Nobody wanted to be with you. Nobody wanted to, you know, you were ostracized from your own family. I remember those days very well. And uh, so what we see with Ebola is a lot of the same thing, and, uh, but much worse uh, in the sense that uh, with AIDS, you, you kind of knew who got it, and then we learned how you do get it. You can avoid it, you know, by having, you know, lack of uh, sexual contact and uh, using a condom and, you know, some of these lessons that we learned and people applied those lessons. But in the case of Ebola, uh, you can actually be affected just by touching somebody who has uh, the disease. You can, you, know, you can be a doctor and get it. You can be a nurse and get it. You can be a taxi driver and get it. You can be anybody. You can be a family member, my brother or sister or mother or father, and just wanted to hold your child who was infected. Uh, that's enough to get it. So the transmission is not clear. Um, you know, it's not fully clear. Um, how do you uh, help somebody if you can't touch them? And the, the, the cultural side of uh, Ebola just makes it a, a much more daunting, even than uh, AIDS. And I never thought we would see today that we would see something more dramatic and more challenging than uh, HIV and AIDS. But Ebola clearly uh, is that, that disease. We're seeing here in the U.S. that was sort of a serum or it's not a vaccine, but there was something done that was helping fight. How do you see any possibility of fighting the, the virus in terms of uh, um, protecting the population? Well, uh, you know, this is another one again. I think in the case of Africa, uh, we don't respond until we see the commercial value of it. Uh, I look at malaria, for instance, and I know we've, we've known how to, to, to address malaria maybe 20, 30 years ago. But have we come up with the right mix of uh, vaccines and, and medicines to address uh, malaria? No. Why not? Because the majority of malaria victims are south of the equator. They're in Africa, they're in Latin America, they're in the Caribbean. Uh, they are not people here in the United States. So for us Americans, uh, we didn't think that a, a malaria mattered. Um, so I think in the case of Ebola, the same thing, you know, uh, here you got this disease. Sure enough, some scientists and some high, the CDC, people like that have been looking at all kinds of infectious diseases and sure they've been toying with it. But they didn't come up with a serious uh, uh, opportunity to address Ebola until now we figure out that we need something. And uh, everybody telling me uh, it's going to take a, quite a, some time to come up with an effective vaccine uh, to prevent uh, the transmission of Ebola. And so in that time, you know, we might be looking at a million people or more uh, having died. So, uh, but I think uh, it also speaks to me of uh, moving, uh, making sure that Africa is at a level playing field with the rest of the world, you know? You were suggesting in a way that if, if, if the people of south of the equator were treated in a way differently, uh, my question is, is there sort of a racism or discrimination in the world of uh, w when a patient gets sick in a part of the world, could be treated differently from in another part of the world? Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. That's well known, and um, it's really kind of sad. Even the case in um, in Texas of the Liberian who came here, and uh, his disease uh, became, you know, he eventually died uh, yesterday, day before yesterday. But uh, his treatment compared to these other uh, Americans who got affected, who were flown back here and isolated, and, and hope and gladly that they have become cured of this. Uh, you know, absolutely different uh, uh, handling of it, and. Uh, sure enough, the life, seeing that the life of an African is a lot less valued than the life of an American or a person in other parts of the world, and, and that has to be uh, corrected. In the case of the person who died uh, in the U.S. recently, uh, one of the skeptics are saying is it was a way of discrimination because it was not, not necessarily was being treated properly. Yeah, the, treat the proper treatment, you know, the, the urgency of it, it seemed like was different. Uh, the treatment of the family, uh, certainly, who were stigmatized and had to move out of their apartment and, and who knows what other uh, things that they're facing right now. Um, it just speaks to the fact that people are ignorant about other people. And um, uh, because he was African, you know, people are thinking, I have a lot of Liberian friends uh, here in the United States who haven't been to Liberia in two or three, four years, but yet they also feel in this stigmatism. All you have to do is say you're a Liberian. Uh, even if you say you're from Zimbabwe, uh, you're going to find people going to be saying, oh, wow, you know, and you're thousands of miles away from the Ebola zone, 
but yet because you're an African, there are a lot of people who will think that uh, you are a risk uh, because you're an African. So the U.S. is a racist country? Well, the U.S. is built on racism, no question about that. Uh, you know, you look at the history of the country with slavery and, uh, you know, and on balance, you know, America is trying its best to address the race question. And it's a long-term proposition uh, that we're making steady progress on. I mean, you know, I don't want to say it's, uh, it's not the same America that was when I was a kid or my parents grew up in, you know, in the South. Uh, but America has come a long way to address its racial issues. But no doubt, there's still issues in America. I think the fact that President Obama has elevated himself to be the President of the United States, a, a black man, speaks volumes of race progress in the United States. But we have a, you know, we're on the right track, we're on the right train, we just need to put more fuel in the tank and address our, our racial issues. But I think that this country is committed to doing it and I'm optimistic. Particularly in the case of, uh, of uh, Ebola, there are critics that say that in the cases that have been done in the U.S., there were negligence. Yeah. I think so. I, I have no question about that. I mean, you look at America generally, you look at the health system generally. If you are a person of, of means and, uh, you know, have all the wealth, you're going to get a different treatment level than, say, a person who uh, works at the post office or a person who might be homeless, who might be another color. And I'm not totally sure it's, it's race as it is class. But um, for sure, America is predicated on those who have access to the resources will get the treatment, will get the, the support that they need. And those who don't have access, which is most Americans, will have a hard time uh, you know, getting the same treatment. So uh, it's not a balanced system, no question about that. And um, you know, it's something that has to be addressed going forward. Uh, this is what Obamacare is all about. You know? uh, it is, it's an attempt to broaden uh, the participation of more Americans in the health system. And you, know, you, know, you can argue that in Congress if you want to, but I think that it's something that uh, this country uh, will have to move forward on. The U.S. government was sending 3,000 army to Africa to, to help uh, fighting Ebola. What do you think? Well, um, you know, I think we have to do something. Uh, I've been involved in a lot of the discussions uh, from inception of this crisis. And uh, I was in a meeting with the Minister of Defense from Liberia a couple weeks ago, and uh, the question was asked about logistics and, um, you know, field hospitals and clearing up the port and, and some of these kind of things, especially after the Haiti uh, earthquake fiasco. And we all remember how the goods and services got stacked up in, in Haiti. Um, and the question was, uh, do you want American assistance in this area? And it was the, question, the answer was yes, that we want that assistance. So I think um, the Obama administration's uh, attempt is to initially address the infrastructure challenges. And you need field hospitals, you need uh, logistical support, and I don't know anybody in the world better prepared to do that than the U.S. military. Um, now, this is not a, a coup d'etat or it's not a, a military uh, takeover or anything like that. You know, it's, it's strictly is a, a humanitarian uh, logistical uh, uh, effort. Now, I also think that a lot of American um, health professionals and, and research professors and, and, and trainers of uh, trainers are also headed out there and they're not military. And so I think in the case of the United States, we're doing everything possible to address the, the crisis uh, facing these countries. What do you know about how the, the Ebola disease started? What, what do you know about the history? Well, uh, you know, from what I understand, um, a lot has to do with the transmission from animals to human. And uh, some say it's uh, bush meat, which is, uh, you know, a certain delicacy of certain people in Africa, you know, and I've been in parts of Africa and, you know, bush meat is what people uh, really want. And somehow the, the virus was able to jump from the, the animal to the human. Now in the past it's been uh, rural areas that have been affected and sure enough we heard about Ebola but you know it lasted for a bit and then burned itself out. But this was the first time that it actually uh, uh, went to uh, urban populations and that's where this big challenge reside. Uh, you got large urban areas that are poor infrastructure, poor health systems, poor screening and this uh, disease was just uh, ripe uh, for the perfect storm if you will. And so this is the big difference, it's the transmission from a, a rural community to an urban community. I think uh, it's that. I think that uh, humans are moving closer. You know, part of this is uh, land issues. You know, we're moving closer toward animal areas, you know, taking them over and like, you're setting up big farms and, and doing those kinds of things, uh, mechanized farming. And, and so people have to be further and further out, uh, closer and closer to animal, animal populations. And uh, so I think uh, the potential for viruses to jump from animals to human 
will increase in that kind of a situation. So that also has to, to be considered. Um, I think it's, it's in that vein uh, that this, uh, this uh, Ebola crisis emerged. How do you think that the African authorities are handling the situation? I think uh, it's a mixed bag. I think the countries, uh, Liberia and Sierra Leone for sure, are doing a lot um, to uh, address it. And they, they, from the start, uh, you know, this occurred, uh, it really occurred during the recent U.S.-Africa Leaders Summit where we had all these African leaders here in Washington uh, for this unprecedented summit in August. And uh, the president from those countries didn't come. Uh, Sierra Leone, who I know very well, President Karoma, uh, elected to stay home because of the emergency at home. And uh, Ellen Sirleaf Johnson, who I also know very well, elected to stay home, even though I know both of them really wanted to be here in Washington for this summit. Um, I think um, uh, the Africans have uh, sounded the alarm. They're doing everything conceivable in their power to address it, but they're overwhelmed uh, by this. And um, they made the call early for international assistance. Um, you know, I think the UN has been called. I think uh, the World Bank has been notified. I think that other governments have been mobilized. And I think that the, the world is, is, is waking up to this crisis. But I think that- um, yeah, Too late? Uh, we're late, we're late, no question about that. And um, you know, it's unprecedented what we're having to do. And so when we say it's too late, uh, it takes a while to mobilize governments. It takes a while to get the World Bank moving. Um, and that, that, that short period of time uh, is causing uh, the thing to, to really uh, escalate uh, beyond control. And so, uh, you know, what do you do? You know, uh, governments move a certain pace and I think that they have moved an unprecedented speed, actually. You know, uh, I think what I'm seeing is unprecedented speed by which the governments of, of the world are mobilizing. But it's, you know, it's, it's, a undaunting, it's, a, it's a really a daunting challenge that we're up against. So the question becomes one, what do we need to do? And I think no one has a handle on, on this yet. But um, what I'm hearing that if we do all these right things and that we respond the best way we can and, and provide the assistance and support that we need, maybe within two or three months, we'll see a, a turning of the tide. And you think that the, that the West is acting because they're really concerned about Africans or is just another example of selfishness that now we start to get the disease uh, among us, so therefore we are creating awareness. If not, we would not really care about what's going on in Africa. I disagree. I, um, I'm glad I disagree on that one. Uh, I think that uh, the United States, I can say that, and I would say most of the governments of the world are genuinely concerned about this and genuinely realize that it's something that must be addressed. I think uh, the fact that uh, the possibility of it being a problem here has certainly um, made it important to the American voters. It, it certainly made it uh, uh, of interest to people in Nebraska who, who are trade, trading mm -hmm. cases. Um, and so the American people themselves are, are concerned. You know, They're concerned for their children. They're concerned for our own survival. So no question about that. That's been a motivating factor. But I don't think that that has been the main reason why the United States is moving. I think we recognize uh, this is a security risk. Uh, if we don't do something there, sure enough, it's going to affect us as a country. That certainly is important to this country. And I think other countries are seeing it the same way. So I think we, we're moving because of our own uh, security interests, but we're also moving uh, out of compassion and a need to uh, address this problem. Uh, just happen to be in these countries in West Africa. If they were in Asia or if they were in Latin America, I would expect the same response. In the particular case of African countries, are the governments doing a rush time education on what the population could do to try to take uh, measures in order not to, to be uh, taking the virus? I think they're doing the best they can. Uh, Sierra Leone last week shut down the government for three days, shut, shut down everything for three mm -hmm. days. You couldn't leave your house. But an ideal of uh, trying to you know, stem the, the movement of the, you know, of the virus, mm -hmm. find out who is infected, and then address those who are affected. I've seen a lot of effort on behalf of the African governments, and no question about it, and they should be commended for it. But I think that it's just a matter of them being overwhelmed with the numbers and overwhelmed with what to do. Uh, you know, you're dealing with countries that are poor. You're dealing with a lot of people who are poor. Uh, how do you, you know, you're dealing with issues of food. You're, you're dealing with uh, economic issues. Uh, how do people go to work? What about people who are working for the government? The governments have been effectively shut down. The schools have been shut down. What happened to these people, you know? Um, and so it's just, a, to me, it's a mind-boggling uh, uh, thing that we're up against. And so I commend the African governments for um, their responses. 
Uh, I commend the Africa Union has taken it on at the highest level. Sometimes dealing with the Africa Union is like watching grass grow. It's a slow, mm -hmm. methodical process, but on a balance, I think that they have uh, taken this on. They, they, they're serious about it. I've talked to uh, Dr. Zuma, the head of the Africa Union, and um, I can sense that they're, they're, they're very concerned about it and they're doing everything that in their power to address it. So, uh, you know, there's not a whole lot of villains out here. I'm even hearing the Chinese are, are now scaling up. Uh, China is heavily invested in Africa, but uh, I hear the Cubans are sending doctors to Africa, you know. So it's not um, about an ideology. I think the world is, uh, is, has woke up to this uh, disease and I'm happy to see that, uh, you know, the whole world is, uh, is, is responding. We have seen already some cases in Latin America. We have seen cases in the U.S. We have seen cases in Europe. Are we going to see more cases in the rest of the world beyond Africa? I'm sure we will. Uh, the thing about the United States and some of these other Western countries, the surveillance systems are good. And, uh, you know, I don't envision the same kind of breakout uh, in the United States that we're seeing in these countries in Africa because of the health systems that are in place. Uh, we are watching, you know, they're watching everything. We're getting ready to move into the flu season here. And uh, so a lot of the symptoms of Ebola are similar to those who have flu. And so there's going to be all kinds of uh, problems in hospitals trying to diagnose who has flu and who has Ebola, you know. Um, there's also a lot of paranoia about it. As soon as somebody gets a headache, they're, you know, they feeling like they got Ebola, you know. So how do you uh, address that? So I'm expecting a lot of chaos. Uh, the airports, uh, I'm ex uh, expecting chaos at the hospitals, I'm expecting, there is going to be some uh, instability, there's going to be some spread of it, there's going to be some real people moving around with Ebola who won't know they got Ebola until they arrive here. Um, and so I'm, I'm sure that's, some of that's going to happen, but I don't expect any major outbreaks uh, outside of uh, Africa. Um, I don't expect it, but uh, who knows at this stage uh, where this is going to lead, and it could well be in some kind of scenario. Right now, you know, there's no, all the major meetings in Africa have been postponed. You know, there's no major conferences going on um, because of the ideal of people having to move around and, and uh, try to stay somewhat separate. And we might see some of that uh, over here also. Uh, these large crowds of people, I wonder if it's a good thing right now to be mobilizing people. Uh, I see uh, a need to lessen that for a period until we get a handle of this. What are the typical symptoms and how this disease evolve until the end? Well, you know, you start out with headaches and um, uh, rashes and, you know, some of these kinds of things that could be uh, a number of uh, things. Um, and then it progresses, uh, you know, worse. And then you got issues of uh, uh, blood vessels breaking and, you know, tissue breaking down. And that's causing the bleeding, uh, red eyes and this kind of thing. And the vomiting and diarrhea uh, are pr prevalent among this. And um, generally uh, the disease is, is carried by body fluids. So we're talking about sweat, we're talking about tears, uh, we're talking about feces, uh, we're talking about blood. And if you don't touch any of this stuff uh, one way or another, you're probably going to be okay. But the problem comes in one way or another, uh, you're coming in contact with a, a person who is infected, uh, you know, uh, fluids. And uh, that's where the transmission is occurring. And so the question becomes on how do you avoid that? How do you minimize, minimize that? And then once you are, are infected, uh, it also seems to be uh, how sick are you? Do you already have malaria? Do you already have other diseases which are prevalent in some of these countries? Uh, or are you a, a, you know, a, a healthy younger person? Who maybe you can withstand this and the fluids and all this that will allow you. So all of those are, you know, it's kind of up to the scientists right now to determine that. But uh, what I'm understanding is um, those are the, the basic symptoms of it. And Mr. Food, what is your advice for every single viewer uh, regarding what they should do, what steps should take regarding these disease? Well, the, the bigger thing we need to do is educate ourselves about Ebola, educate ourselves, educate our families, educate the community about Ebola. We all need to be educated about it and the transmission of Ebola, uh, number one. I think um, I also say Americans, especially as Americans of African descent, the diaspora, uh, we have to be uh, in the vanguard. You know, we have to be more forceful in pressing our governments and pressing these institutions to do more, you know, we have to be the lobby force. You know, I'm, I'm glad that all Americans and all people around the world are are, are are engaged. But I'm pressing my people, you know, people who are African descent, to take a more vociferous role in pressing the world to respond. We have to be on the vanguard of making sure that this stays 
uh, in the news. We got to make sure that it stays in a positive vein. We got to make sure that the families that are affected are getting the treatment that they deserve. And we got to make sure that we're providing the support to our sisters and brothers in Africa. So um, I'm, uh, you know, I, I'm high on the education. I'm high on the advocacy. This is what everybody can do uh, right now. Melvin Food, thanks very much for joining us. Thank you very much. Pleasure. <laughs>